We're changing the math for developers, not just by putting money in specific projects, but by creating uh, a pathway forward. And that's exactly what we're doing with the housing accelerator as well. The federal government is providing the city with nearly half a billion dollars in housing funding. Good evening. The mayor had been calling for the funding for months, saying it's vital to support the city going forward. The money is coming from a $4 billion federal fund aimed at promoting the construction of affordable housing in municipalities across the country. CTV's Mike Walker has been following this story and he joins us live tonight with the latest. Mike. Well, Michelle, Nathan, this funding agreement is expected to help build tens of thousands of homes in Toronto over the next decade. But in order to secure the federal dollars, the city had to agree to several conditions to help bolster the housing supply. As Toronto grapples with a housing affordability crisis, Ottawa is providing nearly half a billion dollars to help meet the housing demand. We'll then unlock a lot of potentials. We have the blueprint, we have the sites identified, we now have the funds, we have the energy and the passion we are building. While touring a Toronto community housing site currently under construction, the Prime Minister announcing the city will receive $471 million through the Federal Housing Accelerator Fund to help fast-track the construction of nearly 12,000 housing units over the next three years and more than 50,000 homes over the next decade. This will include rent gear to income units, affordable and market rental homes. Through this funding, Toronto will make it easier to get projects rolling by simplifying rezoning requirements and modernizing regulations. It'll also update old zoning rules. An agreement months in the making after City Council recently approved a list of changes to its building policies laid out by Ottawa. That includes denser zoning and faster issuance of permits, a deal the government says will allow for more apartment buildings and below market rentals. Cities have made it very difficult uh, to build the kinds of homes that will uh, accommodate people who want to live in cities like Toronto. Uh, and today we're signaling here in Toronto and across the country Things don't need to be that way. The social housing waitlist totals more than 80,000. The city intends to build 65,000 rent-controlled homes over the next seven years. And this is a, a decent down payment, but if we're actually going to make housing accessible for everybody in Toronto, we actually need a long-term funding plan. It is not just about building direct units, which is part of it, but it's also about changing the rules around densification, and zoning so that more and more units can be built uh, independently of the federal government. The agreement will see the city expand its affordable rent programs, develop city land into rental homes, build more affordable homes near transit, and permit four-story residential developments. The city will have no problem meeting uh, any conditions because we want to build housing faster. We hope that a good number of them would be affordable. The housing minister said today that Toronto will receive 25% of that $471 million up front with additional payments over the next few years as the city meets its housing targets. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Michelle. Back to you. Thank you, Mike. Well, both the Prime Minister and Mayor were asked about the refugee situation in the city. The Mayor has been calling on Ottawa to address the number of asylum seekers ending up in Toronto, and those supporting them say they're in a dire situation. CTV Sean Lethon has been following this story and joins us live with more. Sean. Well, Nathan and Michelle, many advocates that we spoke to today talking about how people living on the street are flooding into the shelter system. And while there was a need to build more houses in the future, they need to address the shelter situation right now. On a day when the federal government is announcing funding for housing, advocates for those currently living on the street are saying there is an immediate need going unmet. We have people who are outdoors every single night. We know that it's already winter, it's very cold, and they need somewhere to go. So we need the federal government to commit not just on housing, but on making sure that there is shelter in the interim for people to come indoors. Diana Chan McNally is the harm reduction manager at All Saints Church at Dundas and Sherborne. She says the city's shelter system is being forced to turn away 300 people each night many of them unprepared for the cold. But I'm teaching people how to roll up paper and stuff it into their clothes so that they can stay warm. This is how dire it is. So when I talk about shelter and needing it now, this is what I'm talking about. This morning, federal New Democrat leader Jagmeet Singh was at the East End United Church speaking with faith leaders about the need for shelters. Currently, 40% of those using shelters are refugees. 
Leaders saying the situation is so bad at Dominion United Church, they've been sheltering 215 people since July. So picture that, a group of 215 people sharing two showers. That's what has been happening. Singh says the federal government needs to take responsibility. There's no debate. It's a fact. This is squarely the federal government's responsibility. Currently, Premier Ford and Mayor Chow have a deal that would see $200 million this year for shelters, but it requires the federal government to pay half the cost. So right now we're in a stalemate waiting for our liberal federal government to step up with funding to get people off the streets. It is really just them who are holding this up. Oh, we've seen a spike in asylum seekers. And we're At their housing announcement this morning, the prime minister was asked about shelters for those experiencing homelessness but failed to commit the funding. Uh, I look forward to meeting with the prime minister this afternoon uh, to impress upon him that as the weather turns colder, there's no time to waste. Um, refugees need to come indoor. It's, uh, yeah, we, we need to support. Now, you may recall back in the summer, the federal government said they would have paid $97 million to help address the refugee population in the city of Toronto. As of right now, Diana Chan McNally says that money has not been paid. Now, here at All Saints, they say they need things like jackets, hats, and warm gloves to help the people who are coming to them, knowing they will be outside all night. Reporting live, I'm Sean Neethong. I'll send it back inside. All right, thank you, Sean. Police have upgraded charges against a suspect in a fatal stabbing. Police have identified the victim as 46-year-old Juan Carlos Gomez Salgado. He was rushed to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries, made that life-threatening injuries, after being stabbed inside a home near Bayview in the 401 December 2nd. He died in hospital nine days later. 35-year-old Rigoberto Lopez has been charged with second-degree murder and assault in connection with the incident. A Toronto police officer has been arrested and charged by the service's professional standards unit. Police say Constable Samir Kara has been charged with assault in connection with an altercation between a man and a woman yesterday. Kara was previously charged with assault in a separate incident in the junction in April of 2022. Prior to that, he was one of three officers found not guilty of sexually assaulting a parking enforcement officer at a hotel in 2015. Police say Kara, a 14-year veteran, has been suspended with pay. Police have confirmed the man arrested following a kidnapping yesterday is also charged in the stabbing of an off-duty police officer. 47-year-old Jim Kalazowski is facing dozens of charges in connection with the incident yesterday. It saw a man driving a stolen U-Haul truck arrested after taking a hostage and being involved in several collisions downtown. The suspect was eventually apprehended in the area of Carlton and Church Streets. Police say Kalazowski is also facing several charges in connection with the the stabbing of an off-duty police officer outside of Scarborough Best Buy back on December 8th. And police are investigating a smash and grab robbery at Scarborough Town Center last night. Officers were called to Bon Bon Jewelry just after 7. They say two suspects used hammers to smash a display case. An off-duty police officer and security guard chased the suspects and were pepper sprayed. Paramedics say they treated three people at the scene and took one person to hospital with minor injuries. All I saw when I was looking in like outside into the hallway of the mall, I just saw people running and I don't know, people were running and saying, get out, get out. There was, there was a smell in the air, everybody was coughing, it seemed like something was getting stuck in your, in your throat. We were later told it was pepper spray, but um, it was all over the mall. Everybody was coughing and that was the only thing that we knew happened for sure. Came out seeing people running and I seen a customer come back into my store that I was previously helping. They were hysterical. They were in pain because they had been sprayed. Police say they're searching for two suspects who drove away from the scene in a white sedan. More news in a moment, but first, here's a live look at the city tonight. It is a chilly evening as we officially welcome the winter season in a matter of hours. Those folks really enjoying a beautiful winter activity. Uh, Michelle Jobin has the current conditions. It's a cold one, but we are going to be warming up in the days ahead. We certainly will be, Michelle. And, you know, one of the factors, we're, we're pretty close to our normals for this time of the year today and even a bit milder than that heading to the overnight. But what we're looking at is winds having definitely been a factor in the last little while. They've been out of the east, gusting over 30 kilometers an hour. So that's been giving us a wind chill in and around minus 10 for much of the afternoon. Right now, things have approved a little bit at Pearson. It's minus three, feeling like minus seven. Winds are continuing to diminish as they get through, as we get through the overnight period. So we'll probably be somewhere around minus seven, minus eight is the wind chill for the next couple of hours. And then as we reach our low overnight of minus four, 
the winds will be lighter. We'll have a wind chill of minus six, and that's how we'll start the day tomorrow. So a, sun, a mix of clouds and clearing periods in through the overnight light winds and a low of minus four, feeling like minus six. I'll tell you more about the winter solstice coming up. Back to you, Nathan. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Well, the holidays are fast approaching, and so is the end of the Toy Mountain campaign. People have been hard at work throughout the city in an effort to build a mountain of toys in time for the holidays. For more on the campaign, we're joined live tonight by CTV's Andrea Case. Andrea. Michelle and Nathan, good afternoon, good evening from the Eaton Center. I haven't been here in a while, and uh, I don't even recognize half of these stores. It's pretty exciting. But I do recognize this young lady, oh, Sonia Mangat from eTalk. Sonia, thank you for coming by today. And hello to Aaron. Of course, got to say hello to Aaron. Uh, Sonia, why did you want to come out and support Toy Mountain? Well, you know what? It's one of those principles that I feel like I teach my daughter almost every day that we're blessed. So we can be a blessing, right? Like if you have something that you can give, I feel like it's your duty to be able to do that. So it's so important to come and think about the teenagers because I feel like the teenagers always get a little bit overlooked at yeah. this time of year. So Maya, my daughter, really wanted to make sure we include a gift card for teenagers. And then who doesn't want to play a toy that has a single along, right? There you go. Future star maybe happening. Speaking of a single, uh, these two fellows right now are hot, hot, hot. Everywhere yeah. I go, I hear there's a, a song with the word foolish. You two aren't foolish. We've got <laughs> Andrew and Joe from Loud Luxury, everybody. Why did you fellows, you came with a, two bags of, uh, of toys. Why more did you want to, gotta... more than that, more than that. Why did you want to, I'll start with you, Andrew. Well, for us, number one, we want to get everyone early on DJing, as you can see by our choice of toys here. And like Sonia said, you know, the gift of giving, it's very important to give back. It's so important. Like we, we are blessed where we are in life and we're just so happy to be back home in Toronto and this is our home. So we want to make sure that we're coming and giving back. Okay, well, speaking of your home, you're performing at Rebel. Is that tomorrow? Yes, yes. tomorrow. It's sold out, everybody. It's <laughs> yeah. sold out. But they're going to be in Quebec City. Yep. Yes. And they're going to be in Vegas. They're going to be in Phoenix. So depending on where you are, they're going to be very busy over the holiday season. We want to thank you for coming. We want to thank you for everything you're doing. And the name of your new single? Young and Foolish. They are not. They are not young and foolish, but they are hot and they are happening. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. And us. all the best to you. Thank yes. You. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank Let's you. Go. And so much more coming from the Eaton Center. We'll be back in a few minutes. And uh, thank you, fellas, for thank coming. You. And we'll be back soon. That's fabulous. Thank you. To some other news now, the TCC's board budget was uh, passed last night, but some in the city were hoping for additional transit funding ahead of the holiday. CTV's Allison Hurst has more on the calls for other levels of government to help support Toronto's transit agencies. All we want for Christmas are new. Trains. Carolers sing familiar tunes. with a clear message to federal MPs. We want new trains for Christmas, and it's not just for the season. The longer we wait to ride, the more expensive the trains will get. Asking Ottawa to fund a third of the roughly $2.3 billion price tag of new trains for Line 2. The city is putting a third of the money into these new vehicles. The province is putting a third, but we need that money from the federal government at the start of the new year. The current fleet of subway trains will be 30 years old as of 2026. That, according to the TTC staff report, is the end of design life. Line 2 is under so much pressure, and anybody that rides the TTC every day like I do knows that, as do all of Santa's little helpers here. It's time to do the right thing. This was discussed in the new deal struck last month between the city and province. This request comes as the TTC board passes its $2.6 billion budget for 2024, which includes a fare freeze for the upcoming year and a plan to return to 97% of pre-pandemic levels. I think this budget is a good step in the right direction. Uh, we saw new money for operating. We saw in new investments in making sure that the uh, transit system is safe. TTC board chair Jamal Myers is hopeful the federal government will come through. I think they're very receptive. Uh, they understand that, you know, Toronto needs new trains. The TTC is really the backbone of our city. The budget goes to city council for approval in February. Allison Hurst, CTV News. Still to come, the latest on the war between Israel and Hamas. We'll have more on renewed calls for a ceasefire in the conflict a little later in the show. 
Seven multi-generational Canadian families have scored a victory in court as they fight for citizenship for their children. An Ontario Superior Court has ruled it's unconstitutional for Ottawa to deny automatic citizenship to the children of foreign-born Canadians. CTV's John Woodward has been following this story and joins us with more. John. We talked to the family of one of those Canadians just now, and the, the, the sense we got from them was an enormous sense of relief after a judge found that a law designed to crack down on people abusing citizenship was actually ensnaring regular Canadians. Oh boy, where's Darcy? Where is he? There he is. Darcy is a rambunctious two-year-old like a lot of Canadian kids. He's a really cheerful, silly boy. He loves to joke. Full of mischief. He loves to ham it up. But unlike other wow. kids, when he was born, he had no citizenship at all. You know, going through this was very, very difficult and very scary. That's because he was born in Hong Kong, where both of his parents worked. Emma Kenyon and Dan Warelis were also born abroad, even though they spent most of their lives in Canada. Canada's home for us. Darcy fell into a crack created over a decade ago when the Canadian government amended citizenship laws so that Canadian citizenship could be passed down only two generations of people born outside Canada. It was in response to a perception during a war in Lebanon that people without ties to Canada could call on the government to get evacuated as well as other benefits. This law has really uh, harmed people uh, concretely. Lawyer Suji Chowdhury and, argued and, and in court that there was no evidence of so-called Canadians of convenience and plenty of families who were discriminated against, especially the moms. Emma Kenyon would have been forced to travel to Canada at the height of the pandemic. It's just utterly impractical and harsh. And in the case of women who have to make these choices, uh, deeply sexist, to be frank. An Ontario Superior Court justice agreed, saying the law creates two tiers of citizenship for those born in Canada and those who aren't, saying the latter group holds a lesser class of citizenship because, unlike Canadian-born citizens, they are unable to pass on Canadian citizenship by descent to their children born abroad. Chowdhury estimated the ruling could affect hundreds of thousands of people around the world, many of them who call themselves lost Canadians. Reached at an event in Ottawa, Immigration Minister Mark Miller said he'd want to review the decision. Very sympathetic to the idea that someone who was cut off in that fashion, uh, there's a level of unfairness, I think, to it. It was a measure that was put into place by a prior government, uh, and, and our government has objected to it, and we do have legislation going through Parliament that is int intended to address and redress the situation. Darcy already got citizenship by a special appeal to the minister, but his little brother Sammy could have been born abroad too. Now there's no doubt he and others have the right to call themselves Canadian. The bill before Parliament would make citizenship in this case contingent on having spent three years in Canada, which many of these people say they have done many times over. They're looking forward to a situation where citizenship won't depend on an accident of birth. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, John. The Czech Republic is reeling tonight after the deadliest mass shooting in the country's modern history unfolded in Prague. Police say a student at a university's philosophy department opened fire on campus. After initially saying 15 people had died, investigators revised that figure to 14 killed and more than 20 hurt. The shooter also did not survive. Police say the man didn't have a previous criminal record, but he's also believed to have killed his father earlier today and two other victims last week. The Czech Prime Minister declared Saturday a national day of mourning. A Dutch man convicted in B.C. of extortion and harassment relating to a Canadian teen who took her own life had his sentence shortened today. Aidan Coben was extradited to Canada in 2020 to stand trial on charges linked to Amanda Todd. She died by suicide at age 15 after posting a video saying she was being tormented by an online harasser. B.C. Supreme Court had sentenced Coben to 13 years in prison, but an Amsterdam court said he would serve six years under Dutch law. He's already serving a separate 11-year sentence for online extortion of dozens of other victims. To Gaza now, where the World Health Organization is warning, there are just a few hospitals still functioning this evening. Israel has vowed to keep up its assault against Hamas as the militant group shows no signs of backing down. CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports. As air raid sirens sound in Tel Aviv and people run for cover, in Gaza, almost nowhere is safe. 
once thought to be a haven during a time of war, Gaza is running out of functioning hospitals. Only 9 out of 36 health facilities are partly functional in the whole of Gaza. All of these in the south. There are actually no functional hospitals left in the north. Patients have taken the place of parishioners inside this church, which is on the grounds of Gaza City's besieged Al-Ali Arab Hospital. This church has been turned into an inpatient ward with very serious cases, uh, children, women, elderly people, um, post-operative uh, cases, people with external fixators, people on IV fluids, small babies. The World Food Programme says one in four households in Gaza is now facing extreme hunger. We're trying to reach the people who need us and without a sustained uh, humanitarian pause or ceasefire, we cannot uh, do our job. A report by the integrated food security phase says there's a risk of famine within the next six months if this conflict persists. In Toronto today, while facing criticism from both Jewish and Palestinian organizations, Prime Minister Trudeau repeated that his government is calling for a humanitarian pause as it works towards a ceasefire. That ceasefire cannot be conditional. Hamas has to lay down its arms, it has to release all hostages, it has to stop using civilians as human shields, and it has to understand there will be no role for Hamas in the future governance. While Israel has said it is ready for a humanitarian pause to release hostages and increase the flow of aid, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu shared this blunt message today saying to Hamas fighters, surrender or die. We've heard multiple times this week from Hamas leadership that there will be no exchange of captives until the war comes to an end and Israel pulls its troops out of Gaza. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Meanwhile, Canada is set to offer temporary visas to people fleeing Gaza who have family members who are Canadian citizens or permanent residents. We'd like to thank Minister Miller and his staff for developing these special measures that we know will help save the lives of innocents. While we welcome today's announcement, we recognize that for some Canadians, it's been a very late announcement. The rules offer three-year resident visas to a set list of family members. The federal government noted that it doesn't have control over who is allowed to leave Gaza or when. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, is there a chance you'll be getting a new smartphone over the holidays? If you do, would you consider donating your old one? A program offered by CNIB is helping change the lives of Canada's visually impaired. I'll have the details. That story is just ahead. Well, the holidays are upon us and a new season is as well. Winter officially begins tonight at 10.27 p.m., marking the start of this season. And we'll have some pretty seasonal conditions tomorrow, milder afterwards. I'll tell you more coming up. A lot of people make resolutions in the new year to go to the gym. Well, Evolution is here today. Evolution is at Young and Steel's. It's a gym, but you are donating toys today. Exactly. So we're back again, baby. It's Evolution Chamber. So last year we did it. This year we did it. The year before that we did it. Uh, what we're doing now is we're actually, uh, we got over 200 of our members to donate toys. Um, and honestly, we couldn't do it without our members. And not only are we evolving together, but now we're blessing up the kids together. Wonderful. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year Merry to Christmas. you. And uh, joining me now is the one and only Andy Kim, singer, songwriter, sensational. Andy, why did you want to come out and support Spur Mountain? Well, you know what? Ever since I was a kid, uh, growing up in Montreal, Salvation Army has been very important to us. And um, I grew up in the tenements. They were always there to help us. And um, it's kind of been something that's in my heart. So whenever I do anything as far as traveling the world and singing my songs, I make sure that we donate some of our proceeds away. So this is a beautiful time and a wonderful, uh, wonderful joy. I'm getting emotional here with Andy Kim. Uh, Andy just had his big Christmas show recently. Andy, what's your message to the folks this holiday season? Um, thank God for your existence and forgive your neighbor if you have a problem because it's time to start again. That's what I got to say. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Order of Canada recipient Andy Kim will be back with more from the Eaton Centre as we help build a mountain of toys. Thank you. 
According to the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, an estimated one and a half million Canadians have some form of sight loss. And many people who are visually impaired could benefit from a smartphone, especially with advances in artificial intelligence. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert, Pat. Thanks, Michelle and Nathan. If you get a new smartphone over the holidays, you may want to consider donating your old one to the Phone It Forward program. Donated smartphones are loaded with apps that can help visually impaired people read books, street signs and labels. Smartphones have become powerful computers and new technology is allowing phones that are even a few years old to greatly benefit those with eyesight issues. A lot of people with vision loss, they may not be employed. So um, to go out and purchase a smartphone would be very, very difficult because of the expense. Phone It Forward is a smartphone donation program started by CNIB four years ago. It's already collected and distributed 5,000 smartphones to the visually impaired. The iPhone can be customized to support uh, any type of vision loss, whether someone has some usable vision or if they're completely blind. Smartphones, of course, offer a way to communicate with family and friends, but with advances in AI technology, CNIB has worked with its partners to develop apps that can read emails, texts and books, prescription labels and street signs, making the smartphone an essential tool. The phone can provide spoken information about the surroundings as, as a person travels. By donating your old smartphone, you could help to empower me and half a million other Canadians with sight loss. Phones can be donated at some libraries or you can go to phoneitforward.ca or call 1-833-554-5020. The program is looking for newer smartphones that have been gently used. You'll get a prepaid envelope to send in your phone and you'll get a charitable tax receipt for its value. The phone will be wiped, refurbished if necessary and reloaded with technology that can help change the life of someone who is visually impaired. And a person who receives a smartphone with the new technology will also be given one-on-one -on -one training on how to use it. The phones can also be a lifeline for someone if they need emergency assistance. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. All right, to the forecast, we know winter is starting soon and is starting to feel like it. Uh, oh, yeah, it's cold with that wind chill today. I love that it's finally winter because it means we can get even closer to spring. Let's that's, just get on with it. Right. Let's, Let's just get come into it. Right through it. And uh, some spring-like, almost spring-like weather on the way for you in the forecast. So we'll talk about that coming up. But yes, winter begins tonight at 10, 27 p.m. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. But as Michelle mentioned today, of course, as I'm going to be talking about some milder temperatures on the way, we have had a wind chill that's been a big factor in how things feel today. Winds have been out of the east, 20 to 30-ish kilometers an hour in the Toronto area. So that's really given us at times a wind chill closer to minus 10. Right now it's minus 3, feeling like minus 7 because the winds are diminishing. I should note, though, that if you are in eastern Ontario, it's going to feel a little bit colder than that tonight. In fact, Bancroft feeling like minus 22, Peterborough at minus 13, feeling like minus 19, but minus 4, feeling like minus 8 overnight in the city of Toronto and southwestern Ontario a little bit. It's not mild, but we're a few degrees warmer than our normals for this time of year at the overnight low. And tomorrow, we're at plus 1, which is our normal. Winds will be relatively light. They'll continue to be so. We're going to have some nice sunshine tomorrow, some cloudy periods at times, a little more sunshine for eastern Ontario. If I show you our satellite and radar imagery right now and zoom out, you can see what we have a bit of a mix of some cloudy periods and some clearing at times, and that will be the story through the overnight. We're waiting for a system that's going to advance for Saturday that will bring us some precipitation. It's mostly going to be rain, certainly for the GTA, but I will show you times where we could see a, a little bit of mixed precipitation and or snow. So uh, tomorrow, pretty great day, very seasonable, dry conditions on the road, some cloudy periods at time, a little bit more so as we get into the evening. And then we have the advance of this system overnight. Some mixed precipitation possibly picking up. Rain moves into southwestern Ontario. As we get into Saturday morning, I see some patches here northwest of the city of Toronto heading over towards Milton, up towards Dufferin, Innisfil County. These are areas that could see mixed precipitation or a bit of snow. But this is not a lot of moisture here. This is one to three millimeters of rain. That continues that mixing and or patches of snow, especially northwest of the city of Toronto and then the system moves through by evening. If we take a look at how the next seven days play out, again one degree tomorrow, then zero overnight into Saturday. Saturday 
about one to three millimeters of rain mixing northwest of the city or some snow. Four degrees is the high. Foggy patches, six degrees day and night for Sunday, which is Christmas Eve, the 25th, Christmas Day. Looking like we're going to be getting up to eight degrees. Foggy patches again, so be aware of that. Staying mild into Boxing Day with some showers, and then we look at still continuing milder conditions for the end of the week. Thanks, Michelle. Well, as the show rolls on, we're continuing to build a mountain of toys. The Toy Mountain Campaign supports the Salvation Army in helping make sure every kid has a present on Christmas morning. Let's return now to CTV's Andrea Case. What's happening now, Andrea? Well, first of all, Nathan and Michelle, I have to tell you, uh, the Christmas show is going on right now behind us. This thing is amazing, Sheila. Sheila's here from the, you're representing them all, CF. CF, Toronto Eaton Centre, and Andrea, I'm the general manager here, and I am so thrilled to be part of this great team and all of the great work that CTV and the Salvation Army are doing here this week. How busy is the CF Eaton Centre this week? We are very busy and we are loving it. <laughs> so this show, oh, now it's snowing. There's no snow outside, but there's snow in the Eaton Center. Uh, this is pretty amazing. And you have a tech presentation for us. It's not just that you're hosting us. You've got some money for we the Salvation do. Army. We are very, very pleased this season to be able to present uh, the Salvation Army and CTV for the Toy Mountain campaign. A drum roll, please. Drum roll, please. A ten thousand wow. dollar donation, which we hope will help in transforming our community for a vibrant tomorrow. Thank well, you. as much as I would like to take this check, the check is not for me. It is for the Salvation Army, and Glenn is back. Erin uh, is still here, but Glenn is back. Glenn, uh, what do you say? Ten thousand dollars. Well, thank you. First of all, we're so thankful and grateful for Cadillac Fairview and all that they do to support the community. But here, the Salvation Army and the children here in the community. Ultimately, it's such an incredible gift. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very, very yeah. welcome. And you know, this. How? Pardon me. It's a special time of the year. Special time of the year, absolutely. And you know, it's not just about the toys, Glenn, because everyone talks about the toys, but you do need more than just toys. And I'm just gonna scooch this way so yeah. people can see your face and not the back of my head. Oh, all good, you're, you're right. It's so much more than a toy. It, it opens up the conversation for the Salvation Army. Here with me, Jeremy and Amanda and their kids, Salvation Army officers, but it opens up that conversation with families to be able to talk about the things that are going on and the other challenges that might be happening. Food insecurity, we know so many are struggling with the cost of food and inflation and it creates an opportunity for the Salvation Army to come alongside a family and really make a difference in other areas of their lives and journey with them. So thankful for Jeremy and Amanda and their kids here tonight who, who are a great representation of Salvation Army officers, employees, our volunteers who do such a tremendous job to make a difference in the lives of, of people in our community. Wow. So uh, Jeremy and Amanda here, you've brought your kids out. Uh, how exciting is this time of year for you? It's so exciting. We're so happy to be here and just celebrate uh, this time of year with everyone. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Girls, you ready for Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> if not, we're in trouble because it's almost here. And so uh, thank you for coming out and helping us build a mountain of toys. We'll be back later on in the show with more from Cadillac Fairview Eaton Center. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, everyone. Still to come, more Torontonians are turning to food banks this holiday season. We'll have more on the supports in place to ensure families don't go hungry. That's after the break. As people plan their holiday dinners, there's an increasing number of Toronto residents who are unable to celebrate the way they'd like. Our health reporter Pauline Chan has more on the influx of people turning to food banks to put something on the table. It's going to be myself, my wife, and our son, and, the, and our cat, Thomas. Christmas at the Turley home will be quiet. Peter used to work as a nurse, but since losing his vision and his job, he's had to become a food bank client. It's a small family meal. And, uh, you know, we're not buying the big expensive turkey. We're getting utility bird. In fact, one in 10 Torontonians are using food bank services. And within our network right now, we're serving about 30,000 each month. 
Henry Chu says the generosity of Torontonians during the holiday season means North York Harvest is well stocked for December, but he worries about the future. Whether this trend will continue after the holiday season, um, as I mentioned, we know that more and more people are coming to the food bank. Chu says food bank clients are not just the unemployed. More than 50% have some form of post-secondary education. They just can't make ends meet. And he says the key is creating more affordable housing. You know, in, in the old days when you work, you should be okay. You should be able to uh, make a living, uh, afford your house, uh, you know, have put meals on the table. Um, but that is really not the case at all. And he says all levels of government, private and public sectors must work together. Although this is the busy holiday season, the actual food items needed at North York Harvest tend to remain constant throughout the year. That includes cooking oil, pasta and grains, canned meat and fish, and canned vegetables. When people don't have enough food, Kids can learn as well. Uh, people's health deteriorates quicker. That impacts our health system. That impacts all of us. So when we sort of talk about, hey, food security not only impacting those who come to the food bank, but actually impacts everybody. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Award season is heating up, and we now know who will be hosting one of the biggies. Comedian and actor Joe Coy will MC the 81st annual Golden Globe Awards January 7th. Coy starred in 2022's Easter Sunday, the first big studio movie with an all-Filipino ensemble. The honors will be handed out for the first time under new leadership after the Hollywood Foreign Press Association wound down its operations. The Golden Globes have undergone several changes in response to a fury over a lack of diversity in their voting body. The Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy, court-approved liquidation sale. Still to come, going electric with new federal guidelines aimed at phasing out gas vehicles coming into effect. The city has some decisions to make about how to accommodate electric vehicles. Through this funding, Toronto will make it easier to get projects rolling. Updating our top stories, the federal government is providing nearly half a billion dollars to Toronto to fast track the building of more housing. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said the funds will also go towards modernizing zoning rules. Mayor Olivia Chow said the announcement will allow for more density and types of housing in the city. So right now we're in a stalemate waiting for our liberal federal government to step up with funding to get people off the streets. As those housing plans unfold, homeless advocates say people are in dire need right now, especially as temperatures drop below zero. As asylum seekers take up an estimated 40% of shelter beds right now, the province has offered more funds to the city to help them deal with added costs, but only if Ottawa chips in as well. The longer we wait to ride, the more expensive the trains will get. And adding to the city's wish list from Ottawa, transit advocates were out caroling today urging the Federals for support for new subway train cars on Line 2. The city and province have agreed to pay a third each. According to a TTC staff report, the current fleet of subway trains will be 30 years old as of 2026. That's according to the report. It's the end of design life. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you ever have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. Honda's recalling nearly 300,000 vehicles across Canada because of a fuel pump issue. The company says it's issuing the recall voluntarily, and it covers a range of Honda and Acura vehicles model years 2017 through 2020. Honda says the fuel pumps in those cars weren't molded properly and could prompt engine issues. But so far, there are no reports of crashes or injuries related to the issue. Canadian Honda and Acura owners will be notified by February if their car needs to be repaired. The federal government wants to phase out gas powered vehicles by the year 2035, meaning new electric vehicle infrastructure will eventually hit city streets. CCV's Beth McDonnell has more on the power shift on Toronto's roadways. Damon Runyon lives on an East End street that looks like a lot of residential streets in Toronto's core. Houses are close together with few, if any, garages. Outside his door is one of 50 city-installed on-street electric vehicle charging stations, a place gas cars can't park. Come 2035, the federal government is phasing out gas vehicles. So what's charging going to be like? 
I don't think having like just two stations on a street is going to actually help anyone. Not help anyone, but it's going to be overcrowded. I don't know how they can mandate that by that period. It seems seems a, a little advanced. Motor vehicles are the largest source of local air pollution. Even before this week, the city started developing its public electric vehicle charging strategy, which includes a survey to learn where, when, and how much people need to charge, and looking at the role of other players. As more of these cars come onto the roads, obviously it's not going to be government uh, who's going to be providing all of that charging. There's, a, there's going to be a case for uh, just like gas stations today for the private sector. James Nolan with the Environment and Climate Division says the mandate helps take out the guesswork of what's to come and makes a business case for new apartment buildings and condos to install chargers. In addition to private chargers at malls and workplaces and the ones at city parking lots, he says by the end of next year there will be more than 150 stations on Toronto streets. There's so many factors to consider, and so it's it's not an easy issue. CAA says with a mandate for electric sales, government will have to support infrastructure to make the transition happen while considering older vehicles. You're still going to need gas stations in 2035, while you're also going to need an extensive public charging network and ensure that when it comes to home charging, whether it be in a building or a house, that you've put the parameters in place. Tom Wilson commutes 40 kilometers to his work in Toronto with his hybrid vehicle, but says if the charger wasn't so close by, his wheels wouldn't be worth the cost. With the mandate, Wilson believes market forces will take care of charging demand. It'll get there. I think it'll get there. Toronto has 1 million vehicles on the road now, with just over 20,000 of them electric, meaning the big changes needed for charging are just getting started. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. Air Transat reached a deal in principle last week with the union representing its flight attendants. Now, one possible clause is getting attention in the airline industry. A person familiar with the matter told Reuters the tentative contract includes pay for tasks flight attendants don't currently get paid for, potentially including the time spent boarding passengers. Analysts note that Higher wages mean higher costs for airlines, but potentially less staff turnover. A new survey finds nearly a third of Canadians are spending less on the holidays this year because of the rising cost of living. The Leger poll commissioned by Rates.ca finds 63% of respondents aged 18 to 54 say they set a budget for holiday spending. More than a quarter of them, it's less than last year, say. The survey finds more than 4 in 10 are carrying more than $5,000 in debt outside of their mortgage, while 9% of respondents owe more than $50,000 in non-mortgage debt. On tap tonight, the Maple Leafs are back in action to take on the Buffalo Sabres. Scooped up by Riley, jumping in again. Morgan Riley throws it back. Matthews, the shot scores! Austin Matthews ties it up! The team is coming off a 5-2 loss to the New York Rangers on Tuesday. Puck drop for tonight's game is set for just after 7 in Buffalo. And I am at the Toronto Eaton Centre where it is a really a winter wonderland. We're still trying to build a mountain of toys. We've got one more day after today. Coming up, we have more folks making donations. And again, a reminder how you can donate to the CTV Toy Mountain campaign. We'll see you in a few minutes. Well, at this point, we are putting the finishing touches on our mountain of toys. And there's only 24 hours left to donate to the cause. For more, let's check in with Andrea Case at the Eaton Centre. Andrea. Nathan and Michelle, my cameraman Corey says this is the fastest hour in television, and we're going to keep going. Talia is here from Let's Get Moving. Uh, Talia, why did you decide to donate to Toy Mountain? Well, uh, we're here because Tim, the owner of Let's Get Moving, he has this deeply connection with the Salvation Army. When he was a child, he used to, you know, attempt this kind of events. And now that he started from nothing and now he's had, he has this company, he wants to give something back to all these children and obviously to all the people that helped him when he was a child too. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for bringing all the toys. Guys, give a big wave. And next, we want to say a big shout out to Elf on the Shelf from Kidamo Group, a Red Planet 
Group Company, and uh, they're donating 200 uh, Elf on the Shelves. Aaron, I'm going to scoot you out of the way, and uh, these young fellas here, I'm going to talk to you in the middle because, uh, again, just like this organization, you have a connection to the Salvation Army, and there goes the Christmas tree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're with the Nanlao Foundation. Uh, when I was younger, my siblings and I, we, uh, we benefited from programs like this. So uh, now that I'm able to give back, uh, we are now. So. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, uh, once again, everybody, we're helping to build a toy. Mountain. A toy. Mountain. We'll send it back to you. <laughs> Cannot thank them enough for their generosity. What an amazing hour it's been. And guess what? Some more good news that wind chill is going away. Yeah, it's diminishing as we get through the overnight periods. We're looking at a low of minus four tonight. Just some clouds here and there feeling like minus six. And we take a quick look at our seven day forecast. You can see temperatures are going up over the next little while. So a seasonable day tomorrow with some sunshine up to four degrees for Saturday with some showers, maybe a little rain still mixing or uh, possibly a little bit of snow northwest of the city of Toronto. But it's rain for the GTA for the most part. Foggy patches on Sunday up to six degrees, holding at that six Christmas Eve overnight into Christmas Day where we're projecting eight degrees as the high. I know it's not a white Christmas, but it's good traveling conditions on the roads. And I think that is the best thing. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Michelle. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zarada Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Michelle Jobin and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.